give a welcome to a man that has spoken to more people than anybody in America I know today. A praise to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. We worship you, we worship you, we praise you. All hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel. Hallelujah! 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 Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah! Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is true, God is in this place. Thank you very much for the wonderful welcome, Pastor Barnett. I'm very much impressed to see how you and this church are throwing out the net of the gospel. You are not the keeper of an aquarium. God has put you in charge of the ocean. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. When you want to catch fish, don't do it in the bathtub. You have got to go to the river or to the sea. We need to go out. We need to throw the nets out there where the sinners are, there where the fish is. And Jesus Christ will make sure that they are saved. Amen. And this is the burden of my own heart. As you have just seen there, one little clip Africa is crying out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want to preach the gospel to as many souls as possible. And I believe we will plunder hell and populate heaven for Calvary's sake. In Jesus' name. Let's give a hand for Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. I was sent to Africa by my German church. I went with a burning heart, but I wasn't fit to slot into God's plan at that time. I worked my fingers to the bone and I saw so little impact. I sometimes preach the gospel with tears running down my cheeks. I said, oh God, this is not possible. How can we really fulfill the great commission? I said, if my own ministry has no impact here in Africa. I've told this already so many times. I just want to speak up one minute about it. And then God gave me a vision. It was a dream in the night. I saw the continent of Africa becoming washed in the blood of Jesus. Nation after nation, including Madagascar. And I heard the Holy Spirit say words that penetrated my whole being. And I still hear these words ring in my ears. Africa shall be saved. 
And I have learned in the meantime one thing. Whenever God says, shall be, and you act upon it, then it will be. Glory to God. He that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You do that if you are not saved and you will be saved as sure as God is sitting on the throne in heaven. That vision changed my whole life. Still God couldn't use me the way he wanted to use me. He took hammer and chisel and cut me out of the hardest rock on earth, German granite. <laughs> it was a painful process, believe me. Sometimes I thought I was going through hell. And then the Lord said, now the time has come. Leave that little country. I want to launch you into the whole of Africa. For the first time, I hired a big stadium. Only one church cooperated with 40 people. But I had heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. The first night, only 100 people came. It was a catastrophe. But 100 people, I started to preach, and the power of God fell. I had only preached 10 minutes when people jumped up and screamed, I've just been healed. And I thought, now how can they dare to interrupt my preaching? <laughs> oh, you know, I think sometimes Jesus hasn't got much respect for our sermons. <laughs> and when I laid hands on the people there that moment, all of them were slain in the spirit, something I had never seen before. I was frightened to death. But I saw one blind woman fall down blind and come up seeing. And one cripple fall down crippled and come up walking. That place exploded. After a few days, that stadium was packed. And since that time, we are moving through Africa like a mighty threshing instrument of God. And I say this to the glory of God. I say it to the glory of God because it is a fact. We see nations being shaken under the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Millions of souls are ushered into the kingdom of God every year. And I believe the best is still to come because nothing diminishes in God. Everything increases, including the anointing that breaks the yoke. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I tell you one thing, I love to shout hallelujah. Although some people in Germany persecute me because of it. <laughs> you know, in Germany, you are not allowed to say hallelujah in church. In, in some churches, I better don't say much here. <laughs> I said that many times before, if, if you want to shock the German people, you don't need to commit murder because that wouldn't shock them. <laughs> if you want to shock the German people, you must just shout hallelujah in church. <laughs> and you shock the whole nation. But you know what I found in Africa? I've had, you know, sometimes witches hunt me to throw curses on me, cast spells on me, because when Bonke comes to town, their business goes bankrupt. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Satan is already bankrupt. 
And you know what happened so many times? Most of the time when I start preaching in Africa, I just come up and I shout hallelujah. That's not a ritual, it just flows out. I mean, if you've got it inside, it just flows out. One hallelujah. And I heard testimonies of sorcerers that got saved. And they said it over and over again when Bonke took the microphone and shouted once hallelujah. All their sinister powers broke. Isn't that wonderful? One hallelujah. With one hallelujah. <clears throat> You can crush Satan's most sophisticated power. One little hallelujah. One man shall chase a thousand. If God be for us and he is before us, who can be against us? Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. We are moving, and I believe we will see the fulfillment of that vision, a blood-washed Africa. I've seen hundreds of thousands of souls respond to the call of salvation in a single service. And I went back to my team afterwards. I said, you know, if Jesus keeps on saving souls at this rate, I think the day will come when one day Satan is going to sit alone in hell. Well, that was a joke, but I wished it was true. Amen. I love to make Satan sorry. Jesus has come to destroy the works of the devil. We are not preaching to be popular. We preach. As I said already, that hell will be empty and heaven full. Amen. That is what makes, that is what makes me move and move and move. We want souls to be saved. Tonight I've got a red hot gospel message on my heart. Amen. I want to preach salvation until everybody is saved who's not saved. And the word of God at the same time is the power of God and the sick are being healed. Amen. People are getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. What a mighty God we serve. I count it a great privilege to be here with you, Pastor Barnett, at this mission convention that you have this Sunday and I want to share with you some revelation the Lord gave me on an Old Testament scripture with a fantastic New Testament application. As a matter of fact when God showed, lit that up in my heart some years back, it was, it was to me revelation knowledge. And I just want to pass on to you what God has given to me. Amen. And I believe you're going to be thrilled. Let's turn to the book of Judges, chapter 5. Judges, chapter 5. Now, let me explain to you. I need to give you some little background to this until I come to my three points. The book, the fifth chapter of the book of Judges is actually the song of praise or the song of triumph by Deborah and by Barak, her general. Now that song of triumph was born in battle. Say amen. The enemy, an external enemy, had invaded the country of Israel. And if you know something about the book of Judges, you will know that during the time of the book of Judges, Israel was in a pathetic state because they were absolutely absolutely um, in disarray, disunity. They were at each other's throats, so to speak. 
And whenever God's people are not united, the devil has an easy game to play. And so when the enemy came from the outside, it was quite easy. He took them on, one individual tribe after another. And Israel was just about to be completely conquered by Jabin and his general called Sisera. But thank God the Lord is never outwitted by the devil. Say amen. What did he do? He raised up a woman in Israel for the first time and anointed her with a Holy Spirit. Her name was Deborah. I don't always quite know how you Americans pronounce that name. Is all right? Deborah. And Deborah indeed was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know, when people get filled with the Holy Spirit, they don't act like normal people because they are super normal. Amen. And Deborah rose and she said, we must be united if we are to win this battle. And then she sent out registered letters to all the 12 tribes, sealed letters with a message to please come and join in the battle against Sisera. Now, the reaction of those 12 tribes to the call of Deborah to join in battle is highly interesting. It's something like a revelation to me. And I just want to deal with one or two or three tribal reactions to that call to the battlefield. And I believe that this is a mirror for the church of Jesus Christ today so aptly, so true that you may be surprised. And now I want to read at the end of the battle, now listen, at the end of the battle, Deborah made a round visiting the different tribes, singing her song of triumph as we have it here in chapter 5. And here she makes an analysis of the different reactions of the tribes. And now I want to read a couple of verses. Now you've got the main background. And let me just read my scriptures. Judges chapter 5. And I read from verse 16. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead abode beyond Jordan, and why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Zebulon and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized or risked their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. The kings came and fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanak by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Say amen. Now, let me just home in on one or two or three or four of these tribes and their reactions. First, Verse 17, I'm picking out the tribe of Dan. Deborah asked a question, done a question. Why did Dan remain in ships? Why did Dan remain in ships? Now, for your better understanding, I must give one more explanation about the Dan Knights, and I'm beginning to draw a picture, something like a parable. The Danites were the business people in Israel. 
Dan had an ocean-going fleet of ships that crossed the oceans and returned to Israel with excellent merchandise. And when those ships fully laden arrived at Israel's shores, Dan, I think Dan was the inventor of the supermarkets. He turned his ships into shops and sold straight from the importer to the consumer and made a lot of money. And Dan's business was roaring, absolutely fantastic. He just knew how to do business, period. And one day, it was about evening time, he sat behind the main till on his flagship, or should I call it flagship. And he started to count the takings of the day, counting, counting, counting his shekels, counting his money, counting, counting, and his heart was laughing. He said, this was a profitable day. This was a wonderful day. This was a profitable day. And while he was counting his cash, a commotion down at the pier or the quay, a messenger came running out of breath, running up the gangway straight to Dan and said, Dan, I have come from the judge of Israel called Deborah. Jabin has invaded our nation. Here is a registered, a sealed letter. Please read it at once. You are needed. Dan was disturbed. He jumped to his feet. He took the letter. He broke the seal. He opened it and read, Dear Dan, Jabin and Sisera have invaded our country. We are trying to fight him, but we need your help. Our men are bleeding and dying. Dan, come at once. Leave your ship. Come at once. We need your help. Dan dropped that bundle of cash in his hand. He said, oh, of course, of course I will come. But then a second thought struck him like lightning. And he thought, wow, I can't just run away and leave my cash uncounted. That's number one. Number two, if I now go to the battlefield and fight those Canaanites, what happens to my fleet of ships and shops when I come back? Maybe they have all been sunk. Can I risk my very existence just because Deborah is calling? And he said, number three, by the way, the Canaanites are my best customers. They are advertising in my catalog. How can I be so undiplomatic? And Dan sat down. He stuffed a bundle of banknotes into the pocket of the messenger. Say, go to Deborah. Tell her I really can't come, but I'm with her in spirit. in spirit. Dan. Who is Dan? Who is Dan in the church of Jesus Christ? Dan in the church of Jesus Christ is a man or a woman who are truly born again, because otherwise they wouldn't belong to the family of God, as Dan belonged to Israel. They are born again. They belong to the family of God. But you can never count on them. 
when God calls them to arise and to go to the battlefield of God to preach the gospel to every creature. What a drama! What a tragedy! Then, why did you remain on your ship when God had called you to be on the battlefield of faith? I'll tell you, if there ever has been a battlefield, the greatest battlefield and the hottest battle, it's the battlefield of God to win our lost generation for Jesus Christ. Amen. And I tell you, the church of Jesus Christ is not a pleasure boat. It is a lifeboat. Entertainers are neither needed nor wanted. From the captain to the cook, all hands are needed on deck for soul saving. A church that doesn't seek the lost is lost itself. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, because every soul less in hell is one more citizen of the new Jerusalem by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. I hope you can feel the temperature of my spirit here this morning. Don't touch my spirit too closely. You may burn your fingers because I'm hot. And I'm not in for games. I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. God is calling all Danites. Dan counted his cash while his brothers were bleeding and dying on the battlefield of God. What an indictment. Dan, why did you remain on your ship? That was the question. There must be ships. I'm not saying there must be no ships. I'm only saying Dan was called by God away from his ship onto his battlefield. And when God speaks, we have no option. You know, in Germany, somebody came to me and said to me, Sir, you preach the gospel? Now, what alternative do you have to offer society? I thought, I thought that was funny. I said, alternative? I said, the gospel is no alternative. It is an ultimatum. It's God's word. We have no choice. There is nothing between heaven and hell. Say amen. Oh, glory to God. We have no option. We have no option. This generation can only be reached by people of this generation. And if Christians of this generation don't leave their ships, this generation will go to hell. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is the command. And that is not optional. It's a command. It's not an invitation. It's a command. The Great Commission is a command. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Dan on the ship. Oh my God, Dan on the ship. 
On Sunday, he sits in church and claps his hands and sings of the sweet by and by and of the golden shore. But I tell you, his ship of self-love, self-centeredness and greed will never moor at the golden shore. Never. If you don't believe it, just look around you. You will see plenty of shipwrecks floating. Dan, God is calling you to the front line to preach the gospel. Make yourself available for the living God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Dan on the ship. I know the Bible says that one day the small and the great will have to appear before the throne of God and books shall be opened and questions shall be asked. And the, the Bible says that on for one, 1,000 questions we won't have one answer. And if you ask me what question is going to be asked when Dan has to appear before the throne of God, I can tell you already with authority that I know which question God is going to ask. It's in Judges chapter 5. He will hear the same question from the mouth of God, from the throne of God that he heard that Holy Ghost anointed woman, Deborah, shout up from the quay to his flagship. Dan, why did you remain in your ship when God had called you onto the battlefield of faith? And Dan won't know what to answer. He will just bow, just bow his head and won't know what to answer. Dan, 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 God is calling you. Now let me move on to another tribe, all right? Let's read verse 16. Here it says, For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Now, let me just talk about Reuben for a little bit. Let me give you something of the background. I'm trying to continue painting my picture here, all right? Reuben, the Reubenites, the Reubenites were the thinkers of Israel. The Reubenites were the intellectual elite of the nation. The Reubenites were the people who had the whole alphabet behind their names. Very, very distinguished. I hope you don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against education. Because a little bit of it I got myself. That's not the point here. Now, let me come to Reuben, the Reuben. There were great searchings of heart. What does that mean? That runner, that messenger, arrived there out of breath, knocking on the door of Reuben, saying, Reuben, greetings from Deborah, the Holy Ghost anointed judge of Israel. Here is a sealed, a registered letter for you right now. Reuben took the letter and broke the seal, and he read, Dear Reuben, the Canaanite army has invaded our land. Jabin, the king of Canaan, and Sisera, his general, are pressing us hard. Our men are bleeding and dying. Reuben, we need your help. Reuben, please come and help us now. I call you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Reuben did a very sensible thing. Reuben was inspired and he did what he always did in an emergency. He called his committee together. He loved committees. And he brought all the wise men together, I mean the top of the line. And then they gathered, and then they had their agenda arranged, 55 points, I think. And of course, they started with point number one. 
and then they worked their way down and then they began to contemplate the predicament of Israel and then they came to the letter of Deborah the judge in Israel and hours and hours and hours just flowed and passed by and they were still busy with their proceedings they said no we cannot just rush into battle and do something that has not been thought out well we are Reubenites we are going to have the best battle plans against that Canaanite army that Israel has ever seen we will have it black on white Reubenites oh my god they should have had somebody like Schwarzkopf there but they were just Reubenites great searchings of heart everything theoretical they knew how to conquer the army pincer movements and you know all those wonderful things and they yeah, yes 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 we got the enemy already destroyed however just on paper maybe they had a tea break they got out or a coffee break you and they went out and just to stretch their legs and to just you know relax their minds that have worked so hard and maybe when they were outside they could hear from far the battle noise and on the horizon they could see rows the smoke rise from burning villages maybe one struggler staggered into view bleeding thankfully they were already working on a battle plan they hurried back into session now they had reached at last point number 55 and that was such a sticky point they were not able to solve it well i wasn't there but i can tell you what point number 55 on their agenda was do you want to know hello you want to know i'll tell you anyway Point number 55 on the agenda was just one word, one single word. And that word was Deborah. Deborah was the stickiest of all points. And then the chairman stood up and he said, Deborah! Weak! Feeble! but worse of all, female. Where in the whole Bible do we have one precedence that we, men, must follow a woman into battle? They said, whenever was it heard of that a woman led men except when Eve led Adam into sin now I hope you don't say Bonke said that I hope you you understand Reuben said that all right amen they said we have no scriptural precedence we have no scriptural grounds it's a matter of principle we cannot follow the call of a woman to the battlefield listen they mistook the voice of God for the voice of a woman and that is the tragedy until today many mistake the voice of God for the voice of a man of God or a woman of God they didn't have that insight to see that behind Deborah was the spirit of the living God amen I very much would like to test my audience here this morning I want to ask a question and I would like you to give me a rousing answer. Can God 
use a woman? I would have liked to hear the male voices a little stronger. Let me ask again. Can God use a woman? Yeah. Hallelujah! Yes, God will use a woman. He will use her anyway, but he will use her especially if he cannot find a man. And if God cannot find a man, he will always take a woman. And if God cannot find a woman, he will take children. And if God couldn't find children, the stones would cry out, but God would still do it. Hallelujah! I feel such a powerful anointing on me this very moment. I believe that here this morning, eternal history is going to be made. And that the ends of the earth shall come to know in due time what's going to happen here right now. Amen. Deborah was the stumbling block to those people who thought they were the elite. It didn't fit into their brain box. I'll tell you one thing, those Reubenites thought Deborah was an outsider being a woman, yet Deborah was God's insider because she was anointed with Holy Ghost and power. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes when I am interviewed on television in Germany and so on, secular television, they sometimes say to me, now you're an evangelist, what do you think about evangelists so and so? And then they try to, you know, pit us against each other. On one occasion I said, I want you to know one thing when it comes to evangelism and when it comes to soul saving, I have absolutely no competitors. I only have colleagues. Others may do it different than I. What does it matter? God has millions of ways to address people, to receive the gospel and Jesus as their savior. He has got ways and he's got means without number. Amen. I tell you, anyone who wins one single soul for Jesus, I will salute. I will say, well done. We are standing shoulder to shoulder. We are moving arm in arm. I don't believe in this elitism in the church of God. We are brothers among brothers and sisters. And we give all glory to Jesus Christ, to whom it rightfully and only belongs. Amen. Say amen. amen. This world must be reached. This world must be reached. This world must be reached. We need to reach this generation. I've got such a burden on my heart. We need to reach this generation. Living or dying, we need to reach this generation of ours. Reuben didn't get going because he could not theoreticalize, he could not theoretically, you know, uh, fix it. 
and he depended on his brain box. I tell you, if you are the most educated man in Arizona, I'll tell you one thing, the thoughts of God are far higher than the greatest educated man here or anywhere in the world. Say amen. For God so loved the world, the world, the world, that he gave his only begotten son. Now, I'm glad I finished with Dan. I'm glad I finished with Reuben, except for one thing. I want to tell you who Reuben is today. Reuben in the church of Jesus Christ is a man or a woman who, in spite of all their brilliant intellect, in spite of all, in spite of all their education, in spite of all their talents and gifts, they are totally, absolutely useless to the eternal kingdom of God. And I will tell you why. Because in the kingdom of God, we don't need great speakers. We need men and women boys and girls who stand up and do something for God. Do something tangible. Do something practical. Do something to reach souls. And if you can't reach them yourself, help others to reach them. But don't sit in your conference chamber. Amen. I've finished with Dan and Ruben now. Now I come to one, two more tribes, but I deal with them in one, because every good preacher only has three points. <laughs> Amen. Now, here we go. Verse 18, Zebulon and Naphtali were a people that risked their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. Oh, I am thrilled. Zebulon, Naphtali. That messenger came running to Zebulon and Naphtali out of breath, delivering that sealed letter, saying, Zebulon, Naphtali, the enemy has invaded our land. Do I need it? Desperately need it. Judge Deborah is sending me. Please come at once. When they read the letter, Zebulon and Naphtali looked at each other. They nodded. They had understood the whole thing. Well, they said this. There's nothing to say. We are coming now. Oh, hallelujah. We are coming now. They went from the fields. They hugged their children. They kissed their wives. They exchanged pruning hooks for their swords. And then before the sun set, they were on their way to the battlefield. And the Bible says they risked their lives on the high places of the field. Hallelujah. Dan made money. Zebulon and Naphtali made money history in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. 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 They threw themselves into battle. Yes, some bled, some died, but they fought successfully. And incidentally, God used another woman for the death blow of Sisera. What a mighty God we serve if we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. America shall be saved. And when God says shall be, then it truly will be. But we are responsible for this generation. Zebulon and Naphtali. 
Oh my God. You know, we gave this, you saw a portion of that video. I mentioned that before on other occasions. And we send out these videos in Europe and America and other places. And I heard some voices in Britain. They said, you send us every month a video. And it's always the same, you know. 100,000 souls saved, blind eyes opened, cripples walk. It's always the same. It's boring, you know. Man, I'll tell you, I felt something like holy wrath come upon me. I'm sure it was holy indignation. I said, listen, what is for you a video cassette that you slip into your VCR and then recline in your armchair and then just flick the button and see what's just for you a video cassette is to me the difference of at least 100,000 souls less in hell and 100,000 souls more in heaven. I said, I think you have misunderstood something. My ministry is not a Hollywood ministry. It's a Holy Ghost ministry. I don't come from Hollywood. I come from Calvary. Calvary. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We preach the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And listen, I said it yesterday to somebody. The portrayal of, the, of a crossless gospel is a betrayal. The portrayal of a crossless gospel is a betrayal. I preach Christ crucified. Oh, no. We are Zebulons and Naphtalis. Very simple people. But we've got the sword of the Spirit in our hands. And we are rushing onto the high places of the field to do what God has told us to do. What is God's will for this very, very hour in Jesus' name? If you have an echo in your heart, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. I like that little phrase that says here that Zebulon and Naphtali risk their lives unto death on the high places of the field. On the high places of the field. 1985, we had a terrible accident in Africa. Terrible accident. Seven of our big trucks with our gospel equipment just were rolling from, this, from southern Zaire into northern Zambia. We had a glorious crusade behind us. When a tanker vehicle with thousands of gallons of inflammable fuel approached, driven by a drunk driver. And that drunk driver with his vehicle smashed head on into one of our trucks. Two of our men burned to death to charcoal. The members of the team stood around the burning vehicle crying to God, saying, Oh God, oh God, oh God, have mercy, help us to help them. But they couldn't help them because the heat was so intense. There was no way to help them at all. We were stunned. We were almost numb with pain and grief. 
I stood there with my team at the road. We held hands and we cried to God. And then uh, the Holy Spirit came on us and a holy resolve now more than ever in the name of Jesus. When the news spread back home to Germany, I got some letters. One said, Dear Reinhard, close your whole evangelistic operation. There must be sin in the team. Sin in the team. There was another occasion where I felt holy wrath. I hope you don't blame me. I said, no, Lord. I said, no, Lord. If there was sin in my team, I said, Lord, if you would whisper at two o'clock into my sleeping ear, Reinhardt, there is sin in the team. I would jump out of bed and I would say, Lord, where is it? I want to go now and, and wipe it out. I said, no, God doesn't need to kill two men to let me know there is sin in the team. That's rubbish. And I wrote to these people, shut up. Yeah. Amen. I'm not interested in getting advice from a rocking chair. Don't give us advice without cost to yourself. Eating honey roasted peanuts, watching television, reading a letter and saying, there must be sin in the team, maybe through the tobacco smoke. Oh God, no. No, in Jesus' name. Zebulons and Naphtali's risk their lives. And if you don't believe it, then read 2 Corinthians and read what Paul went through. What he suffered, he said, sometimes he despaired almost of life. I don't want to, I don't want to say too much, but I'll tell you one thing. Zebulon and Naphtali are those who've heard the call of the living God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is not an evangelistic message, yet I pray for conversions here this morning. I pray that Danites may be converted into Sebulons and Rubenites into Naphtalis. Hallelujah. And I tell you, that will be fantastic. Now let me tell you one more thing. One more thing. When Dan died, Mr. Dan, he died as the richest man in the whole nation. He had stacked up his gold bars in his bedroom. He could never sleep at night before he hadn't gloated. He lived for gold. And now he was dying. The angel of death came and wanted to take him. Dan grabbed for his gold to take it along. But the angel of death swept him away and said, you've made your pile. Now somebody else will spend it. Dan died as the richest man in the land. When Reuben died, something else happened. Reuben had a sudden death. He died in the, in the committee room, in the boardroom. When the doctor was called, he said, this man died of a heart attack. He talked too much. <laughs> but Zebulon and Naphtali, risked their lives 
on the high places of the field for the highest cause a human being can live making history in the kingdom of God wonderful history let's make history in the kingdom of God become involved and say Lord here am I if I can't go myself I will help somebody else to go but I want to have a share I want to have a I tell you I feel the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit so greatly here I believe that things are going to happen now that will shake the ends of the earth the ends of the earth and you will one day trace back your thoughts to this meeting and you will say that is the day when I yielded myself to the Lord with everything that I am and everything that I have I have followed I have followed the sound of his trumpet here am I Lord send me I was a boy of 10 years in North Germany when I was in a meeting similar to this except that it was a tiny tiny meeting I think there weren't even 50 people And when that preacher preached, suddenly I heard the Holy Spirit speak in my heart and say, one day you are going to preach my word in Africa. I said, wow. I knew it. It was so clear. It was perfectly clear. My father was the pastor. I went to my dad. I said, dad, Jesus has called me to preach the gospel in Africa. My father didn't believe it. I went to my mother, I said, Mom, Jesus has, preached, has called me to preach his word in Africa. My mother didn't believe it. I became the joke of the church. I was 10 years old. But I knew that I knew that I knew. One year later, Jesus baptized me with the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost came upon me, I knew it a thousand times clearer. I was only 11. And I had planned my life every step. I wanted to be old enough to be accepted at Bible college. I want to go to Africa. I've done nothing else in my life but preaching the gospel. But I'll tell you, I think I've done a lot of harm to the kingdom of Satan. And then my father, well, I, I want to stop now. I feel the Holy Spirit has done it already. The Holy Spirit has now given you a registered letter. It's very personal. Very per Don't look to your neighbor. You, got re you have received that sealed letter now. Break the seal. Read it. It's addressed to you. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Here am I, Lord. Send me. Now, I'm, I'm really coming to the conclusion now. This was a revelation I received from the Lord. And I'm done in two minutes. Remember Mary, Magdalene, that sinful woman who was delivered of seven evil spirits by Jesus. She one day brought a bottle of ointment, an alabaster box, King James calls it. She smuggled her way through all those Pharisees, came to Jesus. And the Bible says she broke the bottle and anointed Jesus with the precious ointment. Scholars agree that that bottle of ointment is a picture.
structure of our lives that must become broken so that its contents, that ointment of all ointments can flow out. And suddenly the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, if you want to be anointed by Jesus, you must first anoint Jesus. Break the bottle of your life, your own will, and all your own plans. I know so many young men, young women, who've mapped out all their life and career and everything. They know what they want to be and what they want to do, but not once in their lives have they said, Lord, what did you have in mind when you created me in my mother's womb? It's time that you ask, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? Take that bottle and break it. And then anoint Jesus who is here right now. Anoint that head that bore the crown of thorns for you. Anoint those hands that were spiked for you. Anoint the back that was scourged for you. Anoint Jesus with the sacrifice of your life. And I assure you, as true as God's word is true, you are going to receive an anointing of the Holy Ghost that will catapult you from your pew here this morning to the front lines of the battlefield of God and you shall be an awesome weapon in the hand of the living God. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads in the presence of the Lord. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who is here this morning who says, yes, Reinhardt, I heard this morning the call of God. Yes, I have received that registered letter. I know its content. I want to be a Zebulon and an Naphtali. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, I repeat that, is not a supercharge for the already gifted and great men and women. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is given to nobodies to the unknown and to the weak. Because Isaiah says, he giveth power to the faint and to those who have no might, he increaseth strength. Become a Zebulon and a Naphtali. If you have heard the call of God here this morning and you want to be a Zebulon and a Naphtali, I challenge you whether you are the oldest person in this meeting or whether you are the youngest child in this meeting. If you have heard the voice of God and you know that God is wanting to send you and you want to sacrifice your life to Jesus, break that bottle that was never broken before then I want to pray with you and Jesus wants to anoint you. Just lift your ha hand wherever you are. I want to see and I want to pray with you. Stand up and come forward. This is holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. Standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all
surrender all. Come on, let's all worship the Lord in the Holy Ghost. Do you know how to worship the Lord in the Holy Ghost? Then do it now. Thank you, Lord, that your spirit is falling. Thank you that your spirit is falling now in Jesus' name. And that many problems are being solved. All those restrictions, all those hindrances, all those hindrances, all those barriers that prevent these people from entering into that perfect call are broken now. Problems are solved now. 
people and you Lord the great sender you will send them anointed with Holy Ghost and fire in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name hallelujah let's just sing hallelujah the anointing is going to continue to sweep over us all let's just sing it for one little moment hallelujah saith the Lord, the wave of my power has gripped you, has lifted you, and shall carry you higher and higher as you seek to obey me, higher and higher, and I will bring you to the pinnacle of effectiveness in my kingdom. Just trust me, trust me, and trust and obey, saith the Lord, and you will know what I can do in and through you, saith the Lord, your God. Now, I beg you, nobody is leaving this meeting. The pastor has got something to tell you, very important, he told me. But just put your hands down. Bear with me personally just for two more minutes. I want to leave now the 99. I don't want to forget number one, that one, that prodigal son, that prodigal daughter. I don't just want to tell you that Jesus saves the whole world and then forget that one little lost sheep right here, right now. You shall be snatched away now from the clutches of Satan. And what we have spoken here about will happen to you this moment if you are not reconciled with God. You don't know that your sins are forgiven. You want to become a child of God now, washed in the blood of the Lamb. I just want to pray for you. Wherever you are, just lift your hand so that I can pray for you. Is there anybody who's not yet saved, but you say, yes, Lord, I want to be saved, or you are a backslider, and you now want to come and slide back to Jesus, and I want to pray for you. 
I'm homing in for the one for whom Jesus went. Is there anyone? I see that one hand. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Is there anybody else? God bless you, madam. God bless you. Is there anybody else? I can't see very well on the balcony because of those bright lights, but Jesus sees your hand. Slip up your hand if you need salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Isn't that wonderful? Here's another one. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. The, do I see a hand? Yeah, I see hands. God bless you. Glory to God. God bless you, young man. God bless you. I just want to pray one collective prayer. And all of you who have now reached their hands off to Jesus to be saved after this meeting, please come and collect here in this corner in front so that you can be prayed for personally. That's the best we can do under these circumstances. I beg you, don't go out the way you come. We love you so much. We want to personally pray with you here in this corner at the end of this meeting. Amen. Lord, I thank you for those who are going to be fishes of man. Thank you for those who will move forward with the flame of the Holy Ghost to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Lord. I thank you already now for all those thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of souls that will be saved as a result of ministries that have been born here this morning. I bless you in the name of Jesus. And the Lord, I pray for those dear people that receive salvation this moment. Lord, I thank you that your blood will cleanse them from every sin and break all bondages and addictions. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I set these people free. And I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will bear witness with them. In Jesus' name, amen. So those dear people that receive Jesus as their Savior, make your way forward on that left side. In Jesus' name, my left side. I hand the microphone back to Pastor Barnett. Good night. I could say a lot about him, but I don't want to take any more of his time. Let's give, and I know we've applauded a lot, but let's give one more welcome to Brother Reinhard Bonnke. Will you welcome the man of God as he comes to present the gospel to me? Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you indeed. Let's give a big hand for Jesus. He's worthy to be praised. The Lamb of God, the Lamb of God on the throne. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to tell you that I count it a great privilege to have been with you, with your wonderful great pastor and all his associates and here with you in phoenix arizona praise god for this church the fastest growing church in the united states of america praise be to god amen And it has been a great, great privilege for me to stand here shoulder to shoulder with my dear, dear friend, Ray McCauley, whom I truly love. God has just put our hearts together long ago. And uh, ever we have been marching to the same beat, the drum beat of the Holy Spirit ever since. And wow you know when the fire burns in your heart and you are driven by a vision for a lost world to be saved you don't want to miss a single divine opportunity 
I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your financial contribution to win Africa for Jesus. I pray that the Lord may bless and reward you for it as you have never been rewarded ever. I believe that such an offering, such a sacrifice, you know, provokes heaven to the maximum blessings. Amen. And I believe you will know visibly and surely that the Lord has blessed you in return. <coughs> Praise be to God. We are leaving for Africa tomorrow via Germany. And we are on our way to the Muslim city of Kano in Nigeria, an ancient Muslim city. 92% of the population there is Islamic. But we go there knowing that the Holy Spirit already expects us there. Amen. Glory to God. And I tell you, we go with victory in our hearts. And we are going to see how the anointing breaks the yoke. It is some years ago, five, six years ago, when the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, and I woke up and I heard these words, he said to me, you shall slam through the iron gates of Islam. Yeah. Hallelujah. I said, Lord, when do you want me to go? When will those gates open? The Lord said to me, those gates will open when you stand right in front of them and knock in the name of Jesus. I'll tell you, people ask me, where is your headquarters? I say, I have no headquarters. I only got the feet quarters. <laughs> the headquarters is up there. We are the feet of God. Yeah. And we want to go. Some have it all here. I think, you know, if our feet are well, are well, you know, we've got the wisdom of God then at the same time. But we want to move and move and go in Jesus' name, winning our generation for Jesus. And I tell you that Africa is being saved. That's what I dream every night. And that's what gets me going. Hallelujah. Glory to God. How many of you would like to pray for us in future? Oh, I, I, I love you for that. I believe in prayerful intercession. We've got a, a, a bi-monthly um, prayer letter or news magazine called Revival Report. You may have it, take it home and see some of these great, great pictures inside there. Or you may get some of our videos. I tell you, some of those videos, when you have a look at them and you see these masses of people and you see the miracle working power of the Lord, it will knock you off your sofa. <laughs> Say amen. I have seen how the Holy Spirit has been mowing down crowds, slain in the spirit, nobody touching them, just, you know, like, like ripe wheat. There I stood lifting hands up and then the Holy Spirit arrived and then you can see that on video. That's why I say God's Spirit on all flesh is no joke. It's reality. It's reality. Go and get that 
paper. If you want to receive it regularly, just leave us name and address. We will send it to you free of charge, but you will be able to pray for us as we keep on knocking on those iron gates and say, open up in Jesus' name. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I've got one more thing to say before I start preaching. When it comes to the Holy Ghost gospel, the gospel of signs and wonders, Satan has nothing to counter it. Nothing. 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 Hallelujah. We don't come with enticing words. But you know, we are anointed. We are anointed. You know, after Pentecost, I've read the Bible again and again and again, the New Testament over and over and over and over again. And I came to one conclusion. After Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, the disciples didn't say, now let's have a prayer meeting like this every week. For power, Lord, send the power. Some pray all their lifetime, Lord, send the power. Next week they pray, Lord, send the power. Listen, God has sent the power. The comforter is here. The Holy Spirit is here. We don't need to pray for power again once we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. We just need to release it. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to preach a salvation message now, short and sharp. Maybe sharper than short. <laughs> but you know, my intentions are pure. <laughs> Amen. And after the prayer for salvation, we are going to pray for the sick. Those two things belong together. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And just sure as Jesus saves souls, so he heals the sick. And what is impossible with man is possible with God. Glory to God. I was interviewed on secular West German television this year. And they said to me, you believe in miracles. What is your definition of a miracle? I said, well, the definition of Jesus is my definition. And he said, what is impossible with man is not at all an impossibility with God. We are moving from the human level to the divine level and what the what the greatest brains and the best scientists cannot do, that is easy for the Lord. It is possible in the name of Jesus. I want to tell you what we have seen, and this is well researched, and we, I give, can give you name and address. It was in the city of Jos in Nigeria. I prayed for the sick, you know, and mass. I mean, we had 160,000 people in a single service. 160,000 people in a service. I don't even see, know all the faces. And I prayed for barren wombs. Yes, I do that, even in Africa. And God wipes away many, many tears. And there was a lady. She said, I had an operation. They took out my fallopian tubes. I, but I want to ask the Lord to give me a baby. And you know, after that prayer, she conceived and gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. Now listen, I'm not finished yet. Hold your hands ready for half a minute later. We made a little uh, vi uh, uh, television special on it. 
after the boy was already, no, well, maybe six or seven months old, we followed that miracle up properly. It's all, all on video, all black and white. And the, <clears throat> they went back to the hospital to interview the doctor who operated on her. The doctor said, no, he got his medical files out. He said, you know, I didn't just remove the fallopian tubes. I removed, I removed the ovaries, both ovaries as well. He said, here are the documents. Now, isn't God mighty? Isn't God mighty? I said, Lord, if you can create a baby without ovaries, you can make a baby grow in a plastic bag. I mean, that's, you know, you get that feeling when all things are possible with God. Hallelujah. You better get ready for a Holy Ghost injection. Yeah. Amen. Now, I'm coming to a gospel message. I'll tell you what. I'm preaching from a scripture here tonight of which I personally believe that it bears out the gospel at its clearest. You may not think so when I read the verses, but I will, you will, you, and you, if you listen, you will hear the gospel coming out at its clearest. And I'm an evangelist, I know what I'm talking about. And I pray that God may just speak to every heart here. Because before this meeting is over, waves of joy will roll through the heaven's heaven. There will be joy in heaven over sinners that come to repentance. Amen. Let's turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And I'm reading this story. I, read, I take the time just to read these few verses. Verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Question mark. This they said, listen now, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Listen to this, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Say amen. Hallelujah. Now, before I come to my one, two, three points. I just want to give you a little bit of the, of the background so that we understand it clearly. And I need your attention so that you can follow the argument because otherwise you may not get, you may not get the meaning of it all. It was early in the, in the morning, the Bible says, Jesus was on his way to the temple. 
and the people love Jesus. Say amen. amen. And as Jesus was walking with his disciples to the temple, somebody must have seen him, some early bird somewhere. And quickly the word passed from mouth to mouth, from home to home. And the people were running onto the streets and they surrounded Jesus and they said, Jesus, please teach us. Speak to us about the things of God, the kingdom of heaven. And my Bible says, and Jesus sat down and taught them. Oh, I wished I could have been a little mouse that morning. Just hearing, listening to what Jesus had to say. What, what a privilege to have listened to the gospel coming straight from the mouth of Jesus. Amen. The people were spellbound because when Jesus preached, he preached with authority, different to when the Pharisees preached. And while Jesus was teaching and preaching and the people were listening, suddenly, this is what I think from the left side, a big commotion, a big, big, cloud of dust and screaming and shouting a group of people coming closer and closer and closer and closer that stillness of the morning was broken Jesus stopped preaching and then when that group came closer they could exactly see who they were it was a group of Pharisees doctors of the law in their religious gowns and those holy men did something rather unholy they had a woman in her midst and somehow this holy man kicked that woman because she didn't want to follow them and then they reached Jesus. I'm still busy with my background, but please listen now. Here came the oldest Pharisee. And he had a long gown on and a gray beard and piercing eyes. And with a high-pitched voice, he asked a question. He said, teacher, meaning Jesus, teacher. This woman here was caught in the very act of adultery. Now, the law of Moses, which by the way is the word of God, the law of Moses says that this woman must be stoned to death. She is worthy of death. But teacher, what do you say? Now listen. This was a trap, the Bible says. I quickly want to explain to you why it was a trap, and then I come to my first point. It was a trap because those Pharisees cracked their skulls and said, we are convinced that this Jesus is a deceiver, he is a charlatan, he can never be the Messiah. They said, we are sure this Jesus is not the Messiah for whom we wait. And they had reasons to believe that. They said, if Jesus was the Messiah, he would not break the Sabbath. We saw Jesus break the Sabbath. We saw him heal a man on the Sabbath and then instruct that man to take up his bed and carry it home on a Sabbath. If Jesus was the Messiah, he would never have dared to, uh, to entice anybody to work on a Sabbath. We are sure Jesus is not the Messiah. They said, by the way, if Jesus was the Messiah, he wouldn't be the friends of the sinners. They said, we saw it with our own eyes how Jesus went into the house of that crook called Zacchaeus, that thief, 
and we saw him how he went with him hand in hand to his house if Jesus was the Messiah they said he would have smelt 10 miles against the wind that that man was a big big sinner but he had no discernment Jesus cannot be the Messiah they said Jesus cannot be the Messiah but now he's so popular with the people what are we going to do and then they figured this out and this was the trap they said we will find a woman in the act of adultery and then we grab that woman take her to Jesus when he is surrounded by people and then we say this Jesus the law of Moses the word of God says that this woman must be stoned to death but what do you say and then they figured it out this way if Jesus would say I am the friend of the sinners why do you want to be so cruel and kill that woman stone her to death then the Pharisees would have said he ye people of Israel this Jesus cannot be the Messiah because he speaks against the holy word of God if Jesus would have said the opposite if Jesus would have said you are right my Pharisees come on boys pick up the boulders and give it to her then they would have said well even Jesus had to acknowledge that we are the defenders of the law of God do you get the point if Jesus would have said yes if Jesus would have said no he would have been in dire trouble now that is the background here stood that Pharisee waiting now for the wrong answer teacher why don't you answer Moses says this woman is worthy of death and she must be stoned what do you say and then Jesus the Bible says with his finger he wrote something on the ground I know that books have been written about what he wrote there I haven't read those books I only have read the Bible <laughs> but I I want to tell you what I believe he wrote on the ground a little later <laughs> Jesus stood up he looked into the eyes of these Pharisees and then he said something that knocked them over hallelujah this is what he said and now I come to point number one he said he that is without sin among you cast the first stone at her that moment something happened that is now happening here as well from the uppermost level right down to here the Holy Spirit began to move that old Pharisee wanting to hear the wrong answer from Jesus he heard it echo in his heart and in his ear he that is without sin cast the first stone at her I wasn't there but I think I know what happened that old Pharisee suddenly by the work of the Holy Spirit experienced something he had never experienced before that old Pharisee the chief of the Pharisees suddenly saw a vision with eyes wide open in broad daylight what did he see he saw two tables of stone with the Ten Commandments of the Lord one table another table and he couldn't help but read commandment number one and after he had read commandment number one and a voice started to speak inside of him a terrible voice it was the voice of the Holy Spirit just saying one word guilty he had to read commandment number two he had no option he read commandment number two that voice came up again loud clear guilty you are guilty in the presence of this Jesus the Son of God 
that far as he looked left, he looked right, if his neighbors also had heard that voice that was crying within him. No, they didn't. They seemed to be busy with themselves. He read commandment number three, guilty. Commandment number four, guilty. Five, guilty. Six, guilty. Seven, eight, nine, ten, guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty. That Pharisee was frightened to death. He realized, he that is without sin cast the first stone. If I pick up the first stone and throw on that woman, that stone is going to be a boomerang. Something like a tennis ball, but of a harder quality. It will strike her and it will strike me because I'm also guilty in the presence of this Jesus. And I think this is what happened. Jesus just stooped down and continued writing. That holy man, he looked left, he looked right, and then he did this. He picked up his long religious gown. And when nobody watched him, he kicked in the reverse gear. Oh my God, oh my God, there was the second eldest Pharisee, he had a similar experience. I'll tell you what happened to him, I can tell you. Listen, when he heard the words of Jesus, he that is without sin among you, something similar happened to him. All of a sudden, his own mind went back five years to the 10th of May. And all of a sudden, he saw himself in a house on a warm spring evening, committing the very same sin he now accused that woman of. And it was ringing in his ear, he that is without sin, cast the first stone. That Pharisee met the fear of God. And the fear of God is a power break. And he looked around and he picked up his holy gown. And when nobody watched him, he kicked in the reverse gear and disappeared. The Bible says from the oldest to the youngest, they were all convicted by the Holy Spirit in their consciences. They were guilty before this Jesus and because of the word of God. They wouldn't dare to cast the first stone. They were frightened that they would stone themselves. Now I want to tell you what Jesus wrote with his finger on the ground. Nothing special. Because Jesus just wrote with his finger on the ground what the Holy Spirit is writing in all our hearts anyway. Just one word and that is the first lesson that Jesus wanted to teach every generation including our modern generation. He wrote on the ground one word over and over and over again guilty guilty all humanity is guilty for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god there is not one righteous no not one our righteousnesses are as filthy rags we cannot stand before Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the way we are. We are all guilty in the presence of the Lord. That lesson must first be learned before anything else can happen. Now let me ask, let, let me test you. Is there anybody in Phoenix, Arizona, or anybody in the United States of America, those that are watching me on television, 
that could stand up before God, before man, and say, I have kept all the commandments of the Lord from the very first day of my life until now. I've kept all God's commandments forever as long as I live. Is there anybody here who can say that righteously and honestly? Honestly? Anybody here? Nobody? Nobody? What about the pastors? Nobody? You know what should happen here? The eldest should stand up and unto the youngest because we are all guilty. We are all guilty and come short of the glory of God. If you agree with that, say amen. Now, I'm coming to my second point. Listen. Those Pharisees grabbed that woman. The Bible says in the very act of adultery, there are so many things that don't rhyme in my own mind, things I don't understand. One point, for instance, is this. If those Pharisees, those Pharisees, those hypocrites, those religious hypocrites arrested a woman in the very act of adultery, I said to myself, now how could that have been? A woman cannot commit adultery all by herself if I get things right. I mean, what happened to the man? Had the Pharisees maybe set the whole thing up? Or was the man maybe a Pharisee? I don't know, but you know hypocrisy is from the devil. They grabbed that woman and they said, now you follow us because today is your burial day. She resisted. When she looked into the eyes of this so-called holy man, she could see something in their eyes. She said, no. When I look into your eyes, I can see it. You are not better than me. You have no right to judge me. You are not better than me. You are not better than me. But she had no option. Those holy men, they knew how to kick poor sinners. They knew it. And then that woman arrived at the meeting place of Jesus. They pushed through the crowd, put that woman right in front of Jesus, and then the argument started. But that woman, I'm now turning to the woman for a moment. That woman, for a split second, she had an opportunity to look into the eyes of Jesus. And when she looked into the eyes of Jesus, it struck her like lightning. All of a sudden she said, oh, I've never seen such eyes, pure eyes. For the first time in my life, I see sinless eyes. Pure eyes, hallelujah. Listen, he that is without sin cast the first stone, Jesus said. How was it that morning? Was there nobody without sin? The answer is yes, there was one without sin. And his name is Jesus. Jesus. The Bible says he who knew no sin was made sin for us. In other words, in this context, Jesus had the right to stoop down and take the first boulder and hit it into the face of that woman. He could have taken the next stones and hit them into the faces of those Pharisees one after another. He could have hit my face. He could have hit your face because we are all sinners and guilty in the presence of God. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it. 
when that woman looked at Jesus for the first time in her life, she saw sinless eyes. Imagine sinless eyes. And when she saw sinless eyes, that's what I think. I think she just, she just collapsed in, at the feet of Jesus. And she said to herself, if anyone can judge me, this is the one. <laughs> This is the one. He has every right to judge me. He has every right to judge me. I am a sinful woman. This Jesus has the right to judge me. I think that woman was so nervous. She heard that high-pitched question of that Pharisee. Moses says she must what do you say teacher I think that woman she was she was cou couched crouched together or what would you call it she was just there she was so nervous so nervous I think she didn't hear the first part of the answer of Jesus she didn't hear when he said he that is without sin she didn't catch that. All she heard was, cast the first stone at her. She put her arms over her head. She started weeping. She said, yes, this Jesus, if this Jesus says, cast the first stone, I have deserved it. I am guilty. Please let the first stone come quickly. Don't be so cruel. Don't wait so long. I have deserved the first stone. Let it come. And when it didn't come, she dared to look up. And the moment she heard the voice of Jesus, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She looked around. She said, wow, everybody is gone. And I read one sentence here that said, gives me so much. It says there, and Jesus was left alone and the woman. That is the moment of salvation. Hallelujah. That is the moment of salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? The Lord said, woman, has no man condemned you? She said, no, I, I can't believe it. They are all gone. No man, Lord. In that moment, Jesus said something that has reverberated through the ages and that is shaking First Assembly and Phoenix today. Neither do I condemn you. Go in peace and sin no more. And something happened the heart of Jesus opened and the heart of that woman opened and the pure love of Jesus was flowing in waves to the heart of that woman and struck her that moment her chains fell off her heart was set free that moment that woman Experience the love of God, the love of Jesus for the very first time in her life. That was love. She all of a sudden knew what I called love before wasn't love but lust. It was not love, it was rottenness and death. The love of God. Nothing is purer than the love of God. She was set free that very moment. Neither do I condemn you. Go in peace and 
sin no more. Say amen. Now I'm coming to my third point, but it's the best one. Are you ready for it? This is already the last one. Listen. Listen carefully. The Pharisees spoke the truth. Listen, please. The Pharisees spoke the truth. Blow the dust from your Bible and read Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22. And there it is written in our Bibles that God himself said, a man or a woman that commit adultery shall die. Shall die. It's amazing. And remember Old Testament and New Testament both are God's holy word. If you agree with it, say amen. amen. All right. In Germany, there are some people, they call this scripture a problem text. It's amazing, man. It's amazing. It's amazing how some people see in every scripture problems and I see in every scripture blessings and solutions. They say this is a problem text. Listen, and they give you the reason why. They say it's a problem text because Jesus should have fulfilled Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, that moment. They say he was obliged to have fulfilled it. They say Jesus, by right and by the word of God, should have picked up the stones and should have stoned that woman. He was, it was mandatory to do it. Because the word of God is the word of God. They say the Pharisees were right. Yes, the Pharisees knew what was written in Deuteronomy 22 verse 22. But these people who see it as a problem, they overlook one big thing. And this is what I want to tell you now. And I think if you get this point, Oh, you will rejoice over it for as long as you live, for time and eternity. Amen? Amen. Listen. Listen. I want to tell you why Jesus didn't stoop down to pick up the boulders, to pick up the stones, to stone that woman. I want to tell you why he didn't do it. This is the reason why he didn't do it. Jesus did not pick up the stones with his hands to execute that woman because, because, because he was that moment already on his way to Calvary to be executed for the sin of that woman, to die on behalf of that woman, on behalf of my sin, on behalf of you and for your sins. Jesus had his, knee, his hands pierced for our sins. That's why he didn't pick up stones. Jesus saves. Hallelujah. You see, it is true that God's word must be fulfilled. But Jesus didn't fulfill that death sentence on those who were guilty. He took our sins and our sorrows and made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary. He suffered and died alone. What a Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God which takes 
taketh away the sin of the world. You don't need to die. This is the glory of the gospel. We don't need to perish. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Jesus is here right now. Wherever you hear my voice, Jesus is entering. And he doesn't come to condemn you. I told you before, I think what I tell the people in Africa all the time. I say Jesus didn't come into this world in the uniform of a policeman. Stalking the sinners. And when you sin, he grabs you and says, I got you. No. Jesus didn't come to arrest sinners. He came to save sinners. He came to save sinners like me and like you. He's not hailing stones on us, but his blood shall fall on us and shall cleanse us from every sin as we have heard so well sung before this message. Glory to God. Does that excite you? Let's give a hand for Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful gospel! The just died for the unjust. Hallelujah. You know, here may be people, here may be people that say, well, listen, preacher, this message is not for me. I never had anything to do with adultery. He may be wives, he may be husbands, they say, Preacher, this message is not for me because I've always been faithful to my wife. I've always been faithful to my husband. If that is so, I say to you, congratulations. He may be young people, they may say, Preacher, this message is not for me. I've had nothing to do with all, any of these things. I haven't begun life yet. This message is not for me. It is for you and I will tell you why. Hear me, please hear me. You can have forgiveness for your biggest sin, but you need forgiveness for your smallest sin. I repeat that. You can have forgiveness for your biggest sin. If it was as red as scarlet, but you need forgiveness for the smallest sin. In other words, the point is not whether I'm a big sinner or I'm a small sinner. The point is not whether I've killed somebody or whether I've just cheated somebody. The point is, whoever we are, we are guilty before God. We need forgiveness of our sins. You need Jesus. That is the point. <laughs> Say hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. One more little point. I'm almost finished. Those Pharisees, when they got hold of that woman, I've been thinking about it a lot. When those Pharisees got hold of that woman, I mean that woman had no choice. She had never in her life intended to attend a gospel meeting with Jesus. Now, never entered her head. Now that glorious Sabbath, those Pharisees got hold of her. And what did they do? They wanted to kick her into death. They wanted to kick her into the grave and shovel it closed. And just by mistake, they kicked that woman to the only one between heaven and earth who could have ever saved her. He that comes to me, I will under no 
no circumstances refuse. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Whether the sin is big, whether the sin is small, if your smallest sin is unforgiven, it's enough to make you go to hell. We need Jesus. Whether the sin is small, whether the sin is great, whether they are few, whether they are many, all of us need Jesus and his forgiveness and everlasting life. Hallelujah. I'm an evangelist. And you know, sometimes, forgive me if I say it the wrong way, I, I don't mean it bad. But I must say, sometimes I feel like kicking. <laughs> Some people are so stubborn. Oh God, why don't they come to Jesus? I don't know. Sometimes I wished I could just help them a little bit. Just a li little bit, you know. But I can't do it because no, in, in heaven you will only find volunteers. Isn't that true? Nobody is going to be kidnapped in the kingdom of God. You've got to make a choice yourself. You've got to say, yes, Lord, I need your salvation. I need it personally. I need it now. I need it for my family. I need it for my life. Jesus, you have taken my death sentence upon you. Tonight, I will receive your peace and eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and I will walk home. I will walk home. Jesus sent that woman home in peace because he was willing to take the curse of her sin and the penalty of her sin which was death upon him. He took her death and sent her home with his peace and his life. That's the gospel. Now, I'm really closing. Listen, will you give me two more minutes? Listen, listen. This has followed me for a long time. I want to come back for the last time to those Pharisees. Please listen. Those Pharisees, those holy hypocrites, those hypocrites, those pretenders, outside, holy, inside, rotten. Now, those Pharisees, when they stood in the presence of Jesus, and Jesus said, he that is without sin cast the first stone, and the Holy Spirit began to convict them of their sin by vision, by memory, by who knows what. The biggest mistake of their lives they made when they picked up their gowns and when they kicked in the reverse gear to run away from Jesus to run away from the only one who could have saved them. Oh my God, what a damnation to have been so close, an inch away from the King of Kings and the Savior of their souls. And then reversing out of his presence. My God, my God. I don't know if I can say it the way I want to say it, but I will say it anyway. Listen, I think if I had been there that day, if I had seen that woman crouch in agony of sin conviction at the feet of Jesus 
and the Holy Spirit would have convicted my own heart, I think I would not have picked up my gown and reverse out of the presence of Jesus. I think I would have done it the other way round. I would have rushed forward, knelt next to that woman. I would have lifted my hands and I would have cried, Lord Jesus, I didn't commit adultery, but oh Jesus, my heart is also not clean. Jesus, I also need forgiveness. Jesus, I need salvation as well. Save my soul. Say amen. amen. It is so easy to be a hypocrite. It is so easy to stand up and walk out as though you are who knows who. It's something else. If the Holy Spirit has touched your heart to rush forward and kneel next to that woman where hundreds of millions of people have knelt through the ages and have received forgiveness of their sins and peace with God, everlasting life, salvation through Jesus Christ. There is a room reserved for you now at the feet of Jesus. Now, now, in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes in the presence of the Lord. Lord, I want to thank you indeed for the glorious gospel. And I want to thank you for having said, he that comes to me, I will under no circumstances refuse. Lord, I thank you that ah, you allowed me, me myself, to have knelt next to that woman and to have received forgiveness and deliverance from all the bondages of sin in my own life. And now, Lord, I know this is the moment for many others to come and kneel at the feet of Jesus to receive salvation, forgiveness, and eternal life. While all our eyes are closed and we are in the holy presence of God, I want to ask who is here tonight who wants to say, yes, Lord, I need forgiveness for my big or my medium or my small sin. It doesn't matter. Even if you would have been the most benign sinner in Phoenix, you still need Jesus. You still need Jesus. Who is here? Who wants to say, Lord, today I want to receive you as my savior. savior. Forgive me my sins. Let me go home with your peace and with salvation because you take my sin and my sorrows. If you want to receive salvation from Jesus now, even if you're a backslider, you want to come back to Jesus and ask him to forgive your sins, then slip up your hand. I want to pray for those who want to come to Jesus. Come on, just slip up your hand that I can see it. Thank you. God bless you. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Just lift up your hands, please. Let Jesus see your hands. Let Jesus see your hands wherever you are there on the balcony. Yes, I see those hands. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Praise God. I've seen your hand, madam. I've seen your hand already. God bless you. Put your hand down if you have had it up. Those who have not yet <clears throat> lifted their hands, come and kneel. Come and kneel next to that woman where millions and hundreds of millions of people have knelt already through the ages 
has room at the cross for you. Just slip up your hand and indicate that you want Jesus to forgive your sins and to save you. you it can't be true that you have been so close and yet you will walk out without receiving Jesus as your Savior that dare not be true. Anybody else, lift your hands wherever you are. Lift your hands. Yes, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Praise be to God. Here are many more. Yes, I've seen those hands at the back as well. Just let Jesus see your hand. Let Jesus see your hand. Thank you, sir. I've seen your hand already. I've acknowledged it already. You may put it down. Praise God. God, praise God, praise God. Let's all stand in the name of Jesus. Let's all stand in the name of Jesus. For you, there is room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there is still room for one more. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Just stay here. All those who lifted their hands or should have lifted their hands, Jesus is waiting for you right here. I want to shake your hand as well. Come forward while we sing this invitation for you. Come. Jesus loves you. Don't look to people to your left, to your right. Come. Whether you are young, whether you are old, come. Jesus loves you. Let's sing it again. There is room at the cross for you. There is room, God bless you, God bless you, welcome, 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 just stay here please, though me, there is still for one, yes there's room at the cross for you. The Holy Spirit is still busy drawing people to come to Jesus. If you came with a dear friend, maybe there is a war raging within his heart. Maybe you could just put your arm around him and have a special prayer with him. Jesus is waiting for him here as well. Come forward. Come. I gave my heart to Jesus years ago the way you give your heart to Jesus now. Come. Let me sing it again. Walk down. Even children, if you are not saved, come and receive salvation now. Jesus loves you. There is room at the cross for you. There is room at the cross for you. Have come, they 